Before we get stuck in, I just want to give a quick thank you shout out to the patrons in the Mutt tier. They are Wilma, Glad Goku, Dare Denny, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K of Warheads, SP Can't Come to the Phone Right Now, Please Leave a Message After the Beep, Beep, Cirrus a Skeptic, Biotin, I've bought the entire helium supply, have fun blowing up balloons now. Thank you all so much. Hey, what's up? I'm Channel Pup, the mascot for the level-headed fanboy. I don't need to tell you that the Sonic the Hedgehog movies are pretty beloved. These films have really resonated with the mass market and done wonders for Sonic's reputation going into the new Roaring Twenties. But one common complaint I've heard quite a bit is that people wish these films were fully animated. The main reason being so that these films could bring us the unique locations found in the Sonic games. And there was a time when I kinda shared this sentiment. However, digging a little deeper, the Sonic movies have done a lot more to represent the iconic locations from the franchise's history than you may initially think. So today, we'll be discussing all the Sonic game levels that made it into the films. And trust me, there is more than you think. Before we get stuck in though, if you love Sonic the Hedgehog and want regular Sonic content in your feed, be sure to hit subscribe, you won't be disappointed. And as always, this video, like all of my videos, is brought to you thanks to the support of my patrons. To find out how you can become a patron and unlock rewards, the Patreon link is in the description below, as well as the Ko-Fi link for one-off donations, which help keep the lights on here at Casa del Pup. Thank you so much. Starting with the obvious one, we've got Green Hill Zone from Sonic 1, which gets represented in two unique ways. There's the very faithful depiction of Green Hill Zone over on Sonic's home planet, and then there's Green Hill's Montana over on Earth, which serves as Sonic's found home. Earth's Green Hills has very little in common with the iconic Sonic 1 stage, its name serving as more of a reference than anything else, as this is more just a small town surrounded by lakes and woodland. It fits the general idea, however with its lack of palm trees and checkerboard cliffs, it doesn't really convey the iconography of the Green Hill Zone from the games. Sonic's childhood home back on Mobius, however, is the highest fidelity version of Green Hill Zone to date, as the stage has been gorgeously translated into a photorealistic art style as though this place actually exists all while adapting the iconography from its Sonic 1 counterpart. Everything is here, the palm trees, the loop-de-loop, -loop, the mountains. It's a place that looks like it was made just for Sonic, with its winding valleys and ramps. What's also cool is that in the movie, we've got a little more world building for Green Hill Zone as we see homes high in the trees. One of these homes being where Longclaw lives and raises Sonic. Green Hill Zone is probably the most iconic location from the Sonic games, and Sega have tried to keep it around a bit more as of late, but I think this movie demonstrates what the games are doing wrong. It gives the place a purpose other than just, it's iconic in a meta sense. This is somewhere people actually live. A little world building goes a long way. In Sonic Adventure 2, before taking off into space, the majority of the game takes place in different parts of San Francisco. It's a huge part of that game's identity. The third act of the first Sonic movie takes place there too, with Robotnik chasing Sonic through the city. Now what's funny to me is that Robotnik had a truck for the majority of that first movie as his primary method of transportation. If we'd seen Robotnik chasing Sonic through San Francisco in his truck, this would have much more closely mirrored the iconography of Sonic Adventure 2. But this is the part of the movie where Robotnik trades his truck in for a super-powered version of his iconic Eggmobile, which is admittedly a lot cooler. I'm guessing this was meant to be an enhanced version of an already existing Eggmobile, given that in Sonic 2 he has a more faithful, less powerful Eggmobile already waiting for him. Now of course, that final battle doesn't stay put in San Francisco for long before Sonic starts using his rings to transport himself to other locations around the world. Now these aren't necessarily deliberate homages, however, almost all of the locations featured have in some way been adapted into a Sonic game before, with the exception of Paris. Yes, yeah, Sonic Unleashed features the region of Spagonia, which clearly draws inspiration from different European countries, including France. However, 
The only set piece we really see here is the Eiffel Tower in the background, which was in no way featured in Sonic Unleashed, or any Sonic game for that matter. So I'm not going to claim that Paris represents any pre-existing Sonic stage. There is, however, a sequence of Sonic running along the Great Wall of China. Going back to Sonic Unleashed, there's Chunan, which is a clear analogue for China that features its own Great Wall imagery. The only real difference here is that we don't have massive dragon structures winding around, which admittedly would have been a nice touch and gone hard, but this is an instance of where an iconic Sonic stage has been influenced by a real-world location, and then said real-world location would be featured in the Sonic movie. Which brings us to another instance of that exact thing, where before returning to Green Hills, Dr. Robotnik chases Sonic through Cairo, as they battle across the dunes outside of the pyramids before Sonic scales one of them. Cairo has, of course, inspired a few Sonic stages. You've got Sandopolis from Sonic 3 and Knuckles, which features pyramids in the background before you enter the pyramid for the second act, then in Sonic Adventure 2, Dr. Robotnik's rocket silo is housed in one of the pyramids, so naturally, Sonic and the gang head there. Now, it could just be a coincidence that these places were chosen, simply because they are iconic global landmarks. I mean, again, the Eiffel Tower has never really featured in any Sonic game. But at the same time, this could easily have been a conscientious decision, given that the pyramids and the Great Wall have both inspired existing Sonic stages. At the same time, I guess it doesn't even matter if it was deliberate or not. We saw Sonic scamper through the pyramids in Sonic and & Knuckles, and we saw it in the film, so deliberate or not, I'm counting it as a reference. That brings us to the final location from the video games to feature in Sonic 1, Mushroom Hill, where Dr. Robotnik ends up lampooned. A whole planet comprised of nothing but valleys full of mushrooms. God forbid it ever rains there, it would stink. We spend significantly more time here in the second movie, at the start when we check back in with Dr. Robotnik, who has made the place his temporary home and built a satellite signal to get himself back to his real home where he actually wants to be. I especially love how this looks after the place has been charged up by Sonic's quill power, and the place starts glowing blue. Now, some did speculate at the time of the first movie that this mushroom planet's inclusion was more just a subtle jab at Mario, which may have been the case, may have been part of the thought process. However, this was a deliberate reference to Sonic and Knuckles' stage, given that in the sprite-style end credits of Sonic 2, the Mushroom Planet is represented by the sprites of Mushroom Hill Zone. So if we just treat these as Sonic stages, that first Sonic movie included Green Hill Zone, City Escape, Dragon Road, Sandopolis, and Mushroom Hill. That's five levels adapted, which isn't bad. I can completely understand the perspective that maybe Sonic should have spent longer in these locations, and that maybe it'd be better if more of those levels' iconography were included, for example, the steeper, hillier parts of San Francisco, to better represent City Escape, or including the dragon structures along the Great Wall. But it was cool to see Sonic visit locations that inspired the levels from the games nevertheless. And I think the film does deserve a little credit for that. So for Sonic 2, we've already got Mushroom Hill. But okay, this one here is maybe a bit of a reach. However, Station Square from Sonic Adventure is just kind of an ordinary city. I don't think it was inspired by Seattle. However, it doesn't look outright dissimilar either. And when we check back in with Sonic in Seattle, there is some clear adventure imagery here, from Sonic standing on the rooftop looking over the city to water rising from the drains. I think this kind of serves as our Station Square reference. It's more of a reach than the others, but it gave me those vibes. The next location is the Mountains of Siberia, where Sonic and Tails battle Dr. Robotnik and Knuckles. Now, there's no shortage of snowy mountainous Sonic stages to pick from, be it Cool Edge or Ice Cap, or Ice Cap. I'm gonna shift Cool Edge aside though, as we don't see any water here, and we've got a temple interior, so that does narrow it down a little. So, Icy Temple, Big Mountain that Sonic snowboards down, this could be either Ice Cap Zone from Sonic 3, or Ice Cap Zone from Sonic Adventure. However, I'm leaning more towards Ice Cap Zone from Sonic Adventure simply because during the end credits, we see the pixel recreation of the Siberia scene, and as Sonic snowboards down the mountains, you can see these orange ramps here, just like the jump ramps in Sonic Adventure, 
which tells me that adventure was the inspiration for this choice. Now, during the flashbacks in Siberia, we do see Green Hill Zone again in reused footage from Sonic 1. However, we also see where Knuckles' tribe was situated, a forest with stony architecture. Now, there's no saying that Angel Island definitely exists in the movie universe, but this could be the more foresty region of the Mystic Ruins, which makes a lot of sense given that this was where the Echidnas were situated in Sonic Adventure. I'm counting it. Even if we don't see much of it, I see a forest, I see stone structures, I see Echidna warriors, it's the Mystic Ruins to me. I'm reaching so the first stage of Sonic Adventure is Emerald Coast, a seaside situated just outside of the Station Square Hotel. You know what else takes place at a seaside hotel? That's right, Rachel and Randall's Hawaii wedding. Sonic is of course not really involved in much of this because this is the allocated pee break scene. However, hotel by a tropical lush seaside with jetties and marinas? Check. Man, if only there were an orca whale somewhere. Now, I'm not counting this as a zone represented, but Sonic running along the water definitely evokes Jungle Joyride vibes. Then there's the big one, the unmistakable Labyrinth Zone. You've got a waterlogged maze, owl insignias in the architecture, these little vibrant crystals, and the many, 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 many traps. Labyrinth Zone is a much more specific design than, say, Ice Cap or Emerald Coast, so it's good to see they really put a lot of time and thought into the set design here. This is of course home to the Master Emerald, and where Knuckles and Sonic finally truly throw down. It was an interesting choice to have the Labyrinth Zone house the Master Emerald, however given that this was forged back on Mobius by the Echidnas, we can't rule out that Angel Island does exist to some capacity. Hopefully we'll get to see Sonic's homeworld be explored a little more, as for now it's still shrouded in mystery. And yes, I called it Mobius. Now, they might not refer to it as Mobius in the films themselves, but they do refer to it as Mobius in the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 novelization. So that's another iconic Sonic location included in the movies. For where Sonic and Knuckles finally team up, you can choose your tropical island paradise. I'm gonna go for... Yeah, I'm gonna go for that one. And finally, on the way to the final showdown with the Egg Robotnik, Sonic and Tails board the tornado. So again, spin the wheel! Now, not so much a zone, but instead a boss fight, we've got the Egg Robotnik, who most consider to be the Death Egg Robot, which probably speaks to just how iconic that finale of Sonic 2 is. But I'm going to go against the grain a little and say that if this is adapting any Sonic boss fight, it's not the Death Egg Robot, but the giant Eggman Robo from Sonic 3 and Knuckles. For starters, there's the sheer scale of this thing. It dwarfs the Death Egg Robot completely. But then there's the fact that it is powered by the Master Emerald, and if that doesn't make it obvious enough, it also shoots fire out of its nose, just like the giant Eggman Robo. So in that second film, we definitely spend more time in Sonic-style environments, even if in parts they are a little more vague as to whether or not they actually represent a specific stage from the games. Mushroom Hill, Ice Cap, Labyrinth Zone, they're all pretty clear. Which would mean that Sonic 2 does represent less zones than the first film, but you do at least spend a lot more time in them, where the majority of that first Sonic movie is just American Roadside. Now we're not quite done yet. For the Knuckles TV series, Knuckles and Wade are headed to the casino districts of Reno. So there is your Casino Night Zone representation. But that isn't all. There is of course the Sonic 2 official movie prequel comic. And this absolutely is canon, but it's also surprisingly kind of important. This comic introduces us to the scavengers that appeared at the start of Sonic 2, but it also sets up the buyer, who is the villain in the Knuckles TV series. So yes, this piece of supplementary media absolutely does feed into the film's universe, in a surprisingly big way. So in the prequel comic, we have Knuckles in a volcanic region, possibly Lava Reef. 
Then, of course, he's taken by the scavengers to the explicitly named Casino Night, where we get a cameo of Espio and Vector the Crocodile. So yes, they do exist in the film's universe, they are just yet to actually feature in a film. Then in Tails' story, we return to Green Hill Zone where Tails is searching for Sonic before he heads to what is clearly Marble Zone, then Spring Yard, then Aquatic Ruin before he finally ends up in Hilltop Zone. So these iconic locations from the games all exist on the planet Mobius. While I like what the movies are doing in taking kind of the real world inspirations for Sonic stages and just going there, I would definitely like to see more of what the prequel comic was doing with these locations make its way into the films. And in a future video, I'm definitely going to pitch how Paramount can make that happen in a fully animated sequel to the existing Sonic movies that doesn't require any kind of reboot. So these are the game locations represented in the universe of the Sonic movies so far. Now, let's do that one thing every Sonic fan hates, and compare this to Mario. The Super Mario Bros. movie has us spend lengthy scenes in locations that are explicitly locations from the games, be it the Mushroom Kingdom or Rainbow Road, and the list goes on. It's also a lot more committed to that video game aesthetic, including things that are just undeniably game mechanics like power-ups. It much more closely mirrors the games it's based upon, while Sonic is a somewhat looser adaptation. Locations in the Sonic games are often inspired by real-world locations, as I mentioned, so the Sonic movies just kind of take him to those locations, but there's no loop-de-loops, ramps, or obvious game mechanics, as these movies are committed to a real-world setting. While the Super Mario Bros. movie dives headfirst into, this is a game, this is a movie that is based on a game, Mario is intrinsically a game character and these are game worlds, and we are just making a movie of that game. And I understand that there's a lot of folks who prefer the Mario movie approach and would absolutely love for Sonic to adopt that. No more Siberian mountains give us the ice caps of Angel Island, complete with the exact same architecture from Sonic 3 and Knuckles. And I can absolutely see the merit in that. I'd definitely like to see more of that kind of thing. Put some sand waterfalls in Cairo, have an orc whale hanging out at the Hawaiian Hotel, or let us visit some of these other worlds. But I wouldn't want to abandon what we have so far. Because the needs of a Sonic movie are going to be different to the needs of a Mario movie. So I'll put it this way, a Sonic project can be carried by its characters. Sonic games have always focused a little more on story and characterization, so the characters alone can make for a solid film. Not to mention that Sonic is inherently built for multimedia. See my video on Sonic's characterization between Japan and Europe, link in the pinned comments. With Mario on the other hand, it's undeniably a stronger brand as far as the public image goes, but at the same time, Mario as a character isn't enough to carry a movie. You have to bring the worlds and the distinctive art style. There needs to be the acknowledgement that Mario is the granddaddy of all video games. Because Mario is synonymous with gaming, there is no separating the two. If a Mario movie were anything but 100% faithful to the world of these characters, it's no longer Mario. And we've seen that with the 90s version. Yes, Mario and Luigi do rock up in red and green boiler suits, battling a dinosaur and there's a bob bomb in there, but it's not Mario because it just isn't in the Mario world. With Sonic, as long as Sonic is in the movie, it's a Sonic movie. The characters are the strengths of those Sonic movies, while not so much the Mario movie. It's why, despite being less successful, the Sonic movies do tend to resonate more from what I've seen. They're more talked about. It's because the characters are the strength. While the world, it's more of a backdrop, and it does just enough to represent the games to get by. Could it do more? Yes. But I think what it does do deserves a little more credit than it tends to get. Plus, my favorite Sonic stories all take place in inherently human worlds that mirror our own, albeit with the abstract architecture required to make these into fun levels for Sonic. Mario's never really done the Mario in the human world thing to the same extent that Sonic has. Sonic is just more versatile as a multimedia character in that regard. Am I satisfied with how they've handled the locations in these Sonic movies? Eh, more or less, to a point. I'd like to see less of Green Hills Montana and more of the distinctive Sonic zones, and I'd definitely like to explore some of these other worlds that have been teased. 
Simply put, I would definitely rather see the actual Casino Night planet from the prequel than Reno. But still, I am just glad to see us going to a casino area. Kinda hoping we'll see Sonic go to one too. Maybe that's where the actual Casino Night can come into it. But what do you guys think? How do you feel about the level inclusions in the Sonic movie universe? Do you think they're doing enough? Do you think they could do more? What levels would you like to see represented? Comment below, discuss. As always, if you enjoyed this video and you want to support more like it, be sure to subscribe, hit the like button. We are so close to 100k now, I can almost taste it. And in the description below is the link to the Patreon page, where for as little as $1 a month, you can get your name in the credits of these videos. A special shout out goes to the patrons in the $5 and above tier. They are Wilmer, Calex, Richard Rogers, Glad Goku, Dare Denny, SSS06, Kale Bennett, That Jordo, Ken K of Warheads, Dazzle Fizzle, SP Can't Come to the Phone Right Now, Please Leave a Message After the Beep, Beep, Surus the Skeptic, Biotin, I've Bought the Entire Helium Supply, Have Fun Blowing Up Balloons Now, and Vera Wild. Thank you to you good folks so much for your generosity, and to all of you at home, thank you so much for watching, and have a great day. Get out of here.